Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. This episode is going to be dedicated to Musk's internet constellation called Starlink, which we touched on in our Colonizing Mars series. We touched on it because this is the service where Musk wrote the outline for a free and independent Mars into one of the sections of his service agreement. We are going to take this topic on from a couple of different angles. The economic model, the benefits over competitors, and the hazards that this system presents if it is allowed to continue forward. Musk has convinced his followers that Starlink will provide the economic boon that SpaceX needs to finance all of their future space endeavors. Several articles believe that this is a $30 billion cash cow for the company by the year 2025, so just four years from now. We are going to demonstrate that they are kidding themselves if they think this is going to happen, and we're going to start with an historical precedent. Apparently, the core of his followers suffer from a lack of long-term memory because they've been played like this before. It wasn't that long ago that they believed Musk when he was selling them leases and PPAs for solar panel systems through Solar City, while claiming to be revolutionizing the entire solar industry. To recap that model, subscribers to Solar City would get a free installation and solar array with no upfront costs by signing a long-term contract. The company fronted the equipment and the installation costs, and they collected lease payments on those systems. Another option was to allow SolarCity to install a system on your house for free, and then they would charge you for the power by the kilowatt hour that you used like any other utility. This was called a PPA, which was short for Power Purchase Agreement. Both of these scenarios required SolarCity to cop up the initial equipment investment, which they financed by selling bonds, which were supposed to be secured by the future customer payments against these systems. Where the Solar City model failed was that the installation and the equipment were costing more than the company could ever hope to recover through the subscription fees. And the more people that signed up for the service, the more bonds Musk had to sell to cover the new installs. As it turns out, a lot of those bonds were purchased through his other companies using government money that was earmarked for other purposes. In the case of SpaceX, Musk used money he received from NASA to develop Crew Dragon. We covered this in detail in our two-part episode on Solar City what Musk sold Tesla. By the time Musk bailed himself out using Tesla shareholders' money, SolarCity was $3 billion in debt because this model had failed miserably. This whole situation was so bad that there is presently a conflict of interest class action moving forward next month in Delaware, and we will be covering that as closely as we can. All other plaintiffs on that case have already pleaded out and paid fines because they could not defend their actions in allowing Tesla to buy SolarCity. Now here we are with Starlink and Musk is planning on doing the exact same thing and the result will wind up being identical because that is pretty much unavoidable. First off, what is Starlink? Starlink is an internet receiving and transmitting dish about the size of a large pizza and the package they sell includes the accompanying mount with the router and the cables that they require. Customers order the kit, arrange for the installation on their own dime, or they do it themselves. No service personnel apparently are assigned that can do this for you. From the looks of it, most people are just putting it on the ground. The dish you're buying is a sealed unit that not even experienced electronics technicians can take apart without completely destroying it. This video on YouTube, dubbed by Ken Kiter, shows the destruction required to access the hardware to see what makes it tick or to make any repairs. And the dish, for whatever reason, has the cable leads attached directly to the dish instead of plugging in like a DAC or HDMI cable. So when the cable needs replacing, it is possible you'll have to buy a whole new dish. Same thing if anything goes wrong with it. Toss the old one away and order a new one. And their very limited warranty runs out after one year. So keeping the thing safe and sound and out of the dirt might be a better idea than keeping it somewhere where your dog can pee on it. The interesting part about this array is that Starlink sells these directly to the customer for $500. According to teardown experts in the field, most likely these units cost the company about $2,000 to manufacture, and that manufacturing is outsourced, not done in-house. The numbers you can find in articles online range from about $1,500 to over $3,000 per dish. So we're going to use the $2,000 figure to be middle of the road and conservative. So if it costs the company $2,000 to build the unit and they sell it for $500, well that means that Starlink is losing about $1,500 per dish that they've put out and they can only recover that cost through the $100 a month subscription fee. Since the company claims to have 500,000 customers on a waiting list at this point in time, that suggests the company will have to carry $750 million in equipment costs just to send out those kits. But that is just the leading edge of the money pit where Starlink is concerned. 
That dish, affectionately referred to as Dishy McFlatface, is useless without a satellite to bounce signals off of. Musk has declared his intention is to launch 42,000 satellites into orbit as a constellation to serve his customers. This is something we're going to revisit later, but for right now, we'll just take him at his word. For the foreseeable future, Starship is nowhere near ready to deliver such payloads to orbit. And while we're showing this frame, let's just acknowledge that this has to be the dumbest configuration for a deployment bay ever. Single hinge point on a rounded surface, no clear exit for your payload, no robotic arm, those satellites are going to bounce off of everything and probably smack that front door open permanently. No Starlink devices have been delivered to orbit using a Falcon Heavy. Wonder why that is, since it's apparently a functional system with a far greater payload capacity, yet to date, the only things it's launched into space were the Roadster that Musk stole from Martin Eberhardt in 2018, the Aerosat 6A mission in April of 2019, and the DoD mission the same June. Dragon Heavy hasn't flown for over two years, leaving only Falcon 9s to make these orbital insertions, carrying 60 of these satellites at a time, and they want to launch 42,000 satellites, meaning they will need to launch 700 Falcon 9s to get the job done. Cost of a Falcon 9 launch, as charged to the US government who paid them to develop the technology, is $50 million for a reused booster, or $62 million if they're using a new one. Again, we'll split the difference at $55 million per launch and assume that covers every aspect of launching the vehicle, including pad lease fees, staff paychecks, and every other associated cost with a launch. 700 launches later, that simple math totals $38.5 billion, just for the launch vehicles. The satellites have a reported aspirational cost of $250,000 per unit. Again, that's an aspirational target for the manufacturing cost, not the cost to date, which has been reported to be as high as $500,000 per unit. To stay on the conservative side, we'll once again use their dream number. The cost of 42,000 of those carries a price tag of $10.5 billion. Current failure rate of the Starlink constellation in orbit is 3%, and most of them are less than a year old. To keep the eventual constellation full, that will require launching an additional 1,260 satellites per year to keep up performance, requiring another 21 $55 million launches. Additional cost to replace the damaged units will total $1.155 billion for the launches and $315 million for the satellites, so call that $1.5 billion annually just for upkeep. Then there's the staff at SpaceX to consider. The company claims to have 10,000 workers under its umbrella, and they expect Starlink to become a major income generator for their company. We discovered that starting wage for a Starlink junior production position is a fairly weak $32,000 per year per employee, salary cost. But the cost of employee to the company, including deductions, benefits, insurances, etc., increases that cost by up to 40%. So the entry positions will actually cost the company about $45,675 per head if all they're making is entry level wages, which comes to about half a billion dollars per year in salaries to service only 500,000 subscribers. Combine that in with the annual failure rate and that's $2 billion per year. That's not counting any lease spaces, utilities, licensing fees, or the network of ground stations that this system requires in order to actually access the World Wide Web. At $100 per month, the company will need 1.75 million subscribers just to cover the extra launches and salaries without biting into the initial cost of setup at all. And remember, we use the conservative estimates on all these numbers. If the satellite costs are $500,000 per and the launches run $62 million per launch, these numbers jump significantly just to get the constellation in place. But here's one more thing to throw into the mix. According to Gwen Shotwell, president at SpaceX, the entire array will have to be replaced every five years, a five-year lifespan on the satellite modules. So in five years, we'll have 42,000 pieces of space junk floating around in orbit being replaced by another 42,000 every five years. The entire premise is asinine. And then the company expects to make $30 billion per year on top of this? At $100 per month subscription fees, that will require another 2.5 million subscribers which will need another 2.5 million terminals, which will cost the company another $37.5 billion in equipment costs, which means they will need more customers, that will cost them more money, and this cycle will never end.
The second part of this is going to compare the service customers would receive against other services currently offering internet in North America. Of course, we're going to deal specifically with the satellite service providers since Starlink specs can't and will never match specs on a typical telecom provider internet service. In case anyone is unaware, generally speaking, satellites have little to nothing to do with providing normal internet service through your local cable or telecom provider. The internet is transmitted around the world using a submerged cable that stretches from North America to Europe. Well, that's not entirely true. This is the network of submarine cables that we use to get data around the world on the internet. This system gets the internet to most of the places in the world that need it. This is the current map on the FCC website for number of providers per service area in the US, and if you remove the telecom, cable, and fiber providers, that leaves this map behind. The coverage currently provided by satellite internet providers which is the entire country from shore to shore. Since there are already satellite service providers covering the entire country, Starlink will merely be an option to one of those services. Starlink manages a max of 61 megabits per second transfer rate that is the best result according to these results compiled by Tesla North, with a low end at around 11 megabits per second in the same city of Seattle. Los Angeles results range from 60.24 megabits per second down to 35.49, with much slower upload speeds in comparison. The best upload speed in any of these results is 17.7 .7 megabits per second in LA, which is half of the download speed. Pings on this chart range from 20 to 94 milliseconds. So how does that compare to broadband provided by cable? Using Ookla, we tested the connection we used to upload our episodes with the results of 820 megabits per second download, 915 megabits per second upload, and a 7 millisecond ping with half a dozen devices connected to the same system that is a program with unlimited data that cost us about $80 US per month. That being said, the 61 megabits per second best result on Starlink is suitable for video calls or gaming, as stated on the Starlink website. So the 61 megabits per second is a decent rate for those purposes, for a single user. If there are two devices using the same link, that speed drops, and drops again every time you add a device to the system. If you have four devices and one of them is streaming Netflix at 25 megabits per second as recommended by Netflix, your experience will vary. And the same is true as more and more users tap into the Starlink constellation. The network will have a maximum amount of data it can transfer over a specific amount of time, and each new user interface diminishes its ability to keep the data rate per unit constant. If you have 10,000 people on a system, they will enjoy quicker rates than someone on a system with 100,000 or a million people. That's just fact. So the more people that come online, the more your data rate is going to suffer. Now the question is, how does that data transfer rate compare against other satellite internet providers? The top two satellite internet providers in the US as of March 9th, 2021 are Viasat and HughesNet. Viasat is the faster network with packages starting at $30 per month data rates up to 100 megabits per second, and a two-year price guarantee. They employ 5,900 people, and they service 687,000 customers in the U.S. Viasat currently has two satellites in orbit to service their North American customers, and their Utelsat satellite services Europe along with parts of Northern Africa. If you've ever used the internet while on a transatlantic flight, you've likely tapped into their Viasat 2. Their next generation of satellites, the Viasat 3 constellation coming in 2022, will expand their reach globally using, get this, three satellites. Global broadband, 100 plus megabits per second transfer rate using only three satellites operating at a distance of 22,236 miles geostationary orbit. That's around 36,000 kilometers for everyone else using metric. HughesNet is the company that claims to have invented satellite internet and currently has over 1 million customers serviced throughout their network. Their packages start at $59.99 with data transfer rates at a steady 25 megabits per second and they offer free installation. HughesNet covers the entire continental US including Alaska through their Gen 5 constellation of 20 HTS satellites in a similar geostationary orbit to the Viasat satellites. Neither of these services requires the customer to buy the equipment that is being installed for free up front. Both of them have caps on their data which can be increased for additional subscription fees. So Starlink does not offer a significant speed versus price advantage to either of these competitors. Someone moving over to Starlink from Viasat would be out of pocket $500 for the rig, paying significantly more for a basic package, have to install the system themselves, and they would lose up to 40% of their data rate. Someone on HughesNet could possibly double their speed depending on their location, 
but they would also be doubling their basic monthly fees and they would have to cough up $500 on top of that. There is one reason and only one reason why Musk would be positioning his satellites closer to Earth than any other established provider and that is latency or ping time. This metric measures how long it takes for one computer to talk to another over the network. Obviously signals take longer to get to and from a satellite 36,000 kilometers away compared to the Starlink satellites orbiting at 550 kilometers above sea level, even with the signals moving at the speed of light. If you've never heard the term ping before, then you're probably not a member of the only community that statistic is vitally important to, and that is gamers. The gaming community lives and dies by their ping rate. Having too much lag in a system means the player will be delayed in reacting to critical game situations that require quick reflexes. And that really is the only scenario where ping comes into play. To cut the lag, the satellites have to be closer to Earth to shave off those precious milliseconds. The closer they are to Earth, the more of them they require to have planet-wide coverage because they require line of sight. The more of them there are, the more cluttered the orbit becomes. However, back the satellites away from the planet to say 36,000 kilometers and you only need three satellites to cover the entire globe. That works perfectly fine for everything else. Now let's be perfectly honest. No self-respecting amateur gamer is playing Fortnite or Call of Duty tournaments on a system with more than 25 milliseconds ping time, so they're not going to be relying on a satellite connection. Let's just remind everyone how many satellites does Musk want to launch? 42,000 of his Starlink satellites. Compare that to the May 2021 data from Pixelytics and the Union of Concerned Scientists, indicating there is a total of 6,542 objects orbiting the Earth presently, 3,372 of which are active, so a little over half. If you add Musk's plan into this mix, that is a seven-fold increase of the entire population in orbit, jumping from 6,542 to almost 50,000. In terms of operational satellites, that is a 14 times increase. It's a little ironic that one of Musk's most quoted pieces of pseudo-wisdom for his followers is, the best part is no part. Yet he is proposing a system of 42,000 satellites to do the same thing one of his competitors is going to do with only three, from a safer distance from Earth so as not to block launch abilities, and then, according to Shotwell, they'll have to replace all of these units in five years, so that number will jump to 92,000, and all of a sudden, orbits start looking way more crowded. Which brings us to something called the Kessler Syndrome. In 1978, NASA scientist Donald J. Kessler proposed a theoretical scenario wherein the Earth's orbit would become so cluttered with satellites and space trash that a collision would occur between two objects, causing a cascading effect that would eventually cause the destruction of every object in orbit. Of course, this would now include the ISS. The film Gravity dealt with this topic in a very cinematic way, where the Russians decommissioned one of their satellites using a missile launched from Earth. And in no time, this explosion set off a chain reaction in the Hubble orbit elevation, initiating a shooting gallery of debris that knocked out all communication satellites in a matter of minutes. Such an event would be devastating to global communication networks, GPS systems, military surveillance, and any other industry depending on satellite function, and it would leave a debris field in various orbit elevations that could prevent future launches. In the movie, a great deal of destruction happens in the first act alone. In reality, this degree of destruction would happen over a much greater period of time. In 1978, when the world was launching 100 or so satellites per year, most of which were short-lived, Kessler determined there was a non-zero chance of this future event occurring. This is a graph from aeroengineer.com that takes the trackable objects in orbit and breaks them down into categories of unknown, rocket mission related objects, rocket debris, rocket fragmentation debris, rocket bodies, payload mission related objects, payload debris, payload fragmentation debris, and payloads. That gives a present total somewhere in the neighborhood of 23,000 known objects, and you can see some spikes around 2007 for payload frag, and again in 2015 when tracking tech improved to find more unidentified objects. Now let's shrink the graph down and add 42,000 starlight satellites to these totals. Just the satellites. No associated pins, fairings, nuts, bolts, or whatever this thing is. Just the satellites that Musk announced for the system. That non-zero chance of collisions occurring just got a whole lot bigger. It is a concern, and the argument Musk makes about his satellites being in a significantly lower orbit than others are no argument at all. If two objects collide in orbit, pieces are going to be flung in every direction at 25,000 kilometers per hour. 
that debris will not stay at the same elevation of the original object. And Musk's promise that as Starlink satellites go offline, they will deorbit by themselves and burn up in the atmosphere seem to be empty promises, since a significant portion of his satellites have failed, and yet those dead units have not fallen from the sky. Thanks going out to Tori Bruno from ULA for posting this on Twitter. It is a timeline for how long it takes dead items to deorbit on their own, and it certainly doesn't work in Musk's favor. Satellites at the 550km orbit that he plans on occupying take years to fall back to Earth if contact with them is lost, and the entire time they're in orbit, they're a hazard. In 2017, the US government logged 308,984 potential space junk collisions. 655 of them were emergency reportable, so call it 850 potential collisions a day with two serious situations daily. That is not insignificant. The Kessler Syndrome is a hotly debated topic. You have astronomers on one side warning of the dangers of cramming our orbits with tens of thousands of additional satellites, and then on the other side you have clueless people arguing with the astronomers, accusing them of being alarmist. Shotwell is, without a doubt, on the clueless side of this debate. In a live interview between Gwen Shotwell and billionaire investor Ron Barron, he asked her this question. So when you have tens of thousands of satellites in orbit, how will you know you're not going to run into other satellites? Her response? Think about 30,000 people on Earth spread out fairly evenly. You could spend your whole life and never see another person. The degree of ignorance and arrogance in her reply is staggering. First, the number is 42,000, not 30. That's how many satellites you want to put up. Second, humans don't move at 25,000 kilometers per hour. Third, if they ever did run into each other at that speed, they would completely liquefy each other. And finally, these satellites cross each other's paths constantly, just as they're doing in this video. On this pass, these two trains of Starlinks zipped through each other without incident. But it will only take one time where a non-responsive satellite knocks another one out of orbit, and that will accelerate the Kessler Syndrome prediction. We say accelerate rather than initiate because the Kessler Syndrome has already begun. On June 1, 2021, NASA and CSA reported finding a 5mm hole blasted through the ISS's Canadarm2. The Canadarm booms are made of graphite epoxy and are protected by bulletproof Kevlar sleeves, so whatever projectile this was went straight through two layers of each material. That is just the latest object collision on the ISS, it certainly will not be the last one. The point being made here is, there are already collisions happening in space. Every time there is a collision in orbit, additional pieces are flung into space as a result. If every collision results in the original piece knocking loose one additional piece, that would double the number of projectiles. If it knocks two loose, now you've tripled the number. So this becomes an exponential function, not unlike those shampoo commercials where you tell two friends and they tell two friends, and, and so, so on. on, and so on, and so on. In the early days, where we are now, that function is in the early stages. Since we are adding to the population of orbital debris at a greater rate than we are subtracting from it, we are increasing the rate at which this is happening. This is why some space agencies like JAXA are looking for solutions to clear Earth's orbit from the tens of thousands of pieces of orbital debris they can track and the millions of smaller pieces that are too small to be tracked but still carry the potential energy of a cannonball. Once the Kessler Syndrome starts picking up speed in the middle of the scenario, these collisions will become more and more frequent, creating more and more shrapnel, and at the end of it we could well be left with a field of debris surrounding the planet that prevents any launches to any orbital elevation. Since the declared intentions of Musk are to launch humankind to the moon and to Mars, where he intends to ascend to the Emperor's throne, he should absolutely be completely protective of those orbits by keeping them as clear as possible, especially in light of the thin-skinned starships that he's planning to use to fulfill his Christopher Columbus fantasies. This is what happens when a 14-gram piece of plastic moving at orbital velocity collides with a solid block of aluminum. And this is the result from the same test using a 1-centimeter sphere of aluminum instead of plastic. For illustrative purposes, let's compare these impacts with a 50 caliber round hitting a stainless steel plate. Velocity of this round is 3,000 feet, or about 1,000 meters per second, and the projectile weighs about 50 grams. These rounds go straight through a stainless steel plate that's 3 quarters of an inch thick, around 2 centimeters or 20 millimeters. Straight through. And the thickness of the stainless steel skin on Starship is currently at 4 millimeters, with plans to go as low as 2 millimeters. Every single object in orbit will breach that skin like paper, 
since everything in orbit moves about 10 times faster than that bullet. Time to take a look at what the global market for this satellite service might be. In a recent interview, Gwen Shotwell indicated that Starlink is looking to tap into what she described as a trillion dollar market with their satellite network. Here's what a trillion dollars looks like as a number. Now this number is the current population of the Earth as of the end of June 2021, which is approaching 8 billion people. So Ms. Shotwell, the president of SpaceX, Musk's right hand person and personal ventriloquist dummy, thinks that somehow they're going to extract, on average, $127 per year out of every man, woman, and child on planet Earth, or about $635 per year for every family of five. We have to wonder if she does much traveling. It would seem that Ms. Shotwell, living the executive lifestyle to which she has become accustomed, with a personal net worth in a neighborhood of $300 million, is unaware that the vast majority of persons living on planet Earth don't have that kind of money to spend on the luxury of internet service. This interactive map of the world on worlddata.info allows the user to click on any country in the world and find out what the current average annual income is in that country. The green countries make over $12,000 per year. The dark green countries make over $50,000 per year per working person. The red countries, however, make less than $12,000 per year, and the deep red nations make less than $1,000 per year per working person. Both of the top two most populous countries in the world, China and India, are in the red. So is Mexico, where World Data reports an average annual income of $9,480 per person. If Ms. Shotwell thinks she will be selling $500 signal boxes and $100 per month subscriptions to these large populations of people, she needs to give that blonde wig a shake. Let's take that map and remove all the countries in red, so all the countries where the vast majority make less than $1,000 per month. That leaves Canada and the US, most but not all of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and a handful of countries in the Middle East and South America. And guess what? Every single one of those countries is already serviced with global broadband internet through the existing oceanic cable system, into which Starship will have to tap anyway. That's something else that people seem to have overlooked. The Starlink constellation will never outperform the ground-based nexus because it still has to tie in to that same system. It will never be faster or have a better ping rating than the core system itself. People will always be better off with a cable connection. It's cheaper, it's faster, and it's more reliable. Which is probably why the worldwide satellite internet market, while expected to be a growth industry, is valued at only $3.424 billion in May of 2021, and is forecasted to roughly double by 2026 to $6.896 billion. So if Ms. Shotwell captured the entire global satellite industry, put everyone else out of business, and stood alone as the sole provider of satellite internet in the world, she would manage to make about one half of 1% the amount of money she says Starlink is poised to create for her boss. In other words, she's completely speaking out of her ass. Kind of like when she told that TED talk in 2018. Oh no, it's definitely gonna happen. This is definitely gonna happen. Uh, how? Anyone taking a hard look at the numbers can determine pretty quickly that they just do not add up. You'd have to be completely oblivious to give Musk any money for this at all. You'd have to be almost as clueless as the federal government. Yep, in December of 2020, the FCC announced that SpaceX was one of the satellite internet providers chosen to receive almost a billion dollars in taxpayers' money to set up their constellation to service 642,925 locations across the U.S. This is a Musk project. Of course there's a government subsidy that he can bleed dry. This is how much money the FCC earmarked for Starlink. $885,500,000. This is how many locations Musk needs to service. 642925 So this is how much the FCC is prepared to pay per location for Musk to do what he promised. $1,380 per location. But that won't even cover the equipment cost of the kit that Starlink has to send out to each of those addresses. This FCC money is not guaranteed, and it won't come in a lump sum. It's based on performance, and it will be split over the next 10 years, payable in monthly installments. In order to receive any of the money, Starlink has to prove the system's ability to service those customers, maintaining a latency rate under 100 milliseconds, 
while providing speeds of 100 megabits per second downstream and 20 megabits per second upstream. Something odd about this process is that in June of 2020, the FCC released a report throwing doubt on Starlink's ability to make good on their claims. They were not convinced that Starlink would be able to provide the speeds and latency required to qualify for what they called the RDOF, or Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. It's a concern that was seconded by Ookla in May of 2021. As one of the top apps for measuring such metrics, Ookla believes that the system might eventually qualify for the upload speeds, but is already falling well short on the download speeds. Meaning that Starlink won't qualify for the RDOF subsidy because they will not hit the benchmarks. So it's a mystery why, in December of 2020, the FCC suddenly announced SpaceX had won the low latency auction aspect of their subsidy program, and they were tentatively awarding SpaceX almost a billion dollars spread over 10 years in monthly payments. All of a sudden, they apparently saw something that changed their mind, and it made them think that this would be a good investment after all. Boy, were they wrong. On June 30th, 2021, a year after the FCC expressed their doubts and six months after they changed their mind and announced SpaceX to be the auction winner, Musk is now telling the world that Starlink is already flirting with bankruptcy and that he needs another $30 billion to get Starlink up and running, or about 30 times what he's been promised by the FCC, and he needs it quickly to avoid going under. So how is he going to pull that off exactly? We've already gone through the money losing machine that Starlink is likely to be, and when a company needs to raise a bunch of money quickly to stop the bleeding of red ink, there are three little letters that they tend to turn to. And wouldn't you know it, Musk is already teasing the idea of spinning Starlink off from SpaceX with, you got it, an IPO. On June 24th, as we were finalizing the script for this video, this article came out, and to absolutely nobody's surprise, Musk is already teasing an initial public offering. He said this will happen when Starlink's revenue becomes more predictable. An initial public offering is when a company decides to sell shares to the public and allow them to be exchanged on the open market. This is often done when companies believe they are ready for the scrutiny and reporting practices that are required, but it's also done to try to keep companies afloat with an infusion of shareholder money on the open market. And the best way, as Musk knows, to drive up the price of that IPO is with hype. Now here is the short list of reasons why you will want to stay the hell away from the Starlink IPO. First off, as we've already outlined, this system is unremarkable and will lose money hand over fist. Second, the declared intention of Musk is to use Starlink revenues to finance future SpaceX operations. They will be spinning off Starlink, offering an IPO on Starlink, not SpaceX, yet the revenue stream of Starlink is meant to benefit another privately held Musk company of which the shareholders will have no stake. In order to spin off an IPO for Starlink, it will have to become a separate entity from SpaceX, but then it's going to send all the revenue that it makes to this other company? These two statements made by Musk are in direct opposition to each other. If the idea of Starlink is to create an unending source of money for Musk to use to further his off-world enterprises, then he will need to keep as much of that revenue to himself as possible. If the company goes public, then he would have to split that wealth in return for a lump sum earned at the release of the IPO. The only way that SpaceX would be able to make money from those shares is either by declaring dividends that are payable to all shareholders in that share class, or by speculating in the stock. If Musk intends to keep all of those dividends to himself, then he and SpaceX would buy preferred shares and release only common shares to the general public. Here's the thing, Musk doesn't pay dividends, ever. Tesla is supposed to be one of the biggest companies in the world by market cap, but shareholders have never received one thin dime in dividends. Musk won't be able to pay out just one group of people, unless he does a different series of shares, where preferred shares will get paid out dividends, while common shares will get paid nothing. And again, we'll use Tesla as an example here. The Tesla shareholder agreement states quite clearly that Tesla has never and will not be paying out dividends on their shares in the foreseeable future. This also takes us back full circle to Solar City. Solar City went public in December of 2012 with an IPO price of $8, raising $92 million for the company to put towards purchasing the equipment that they were then leasing to their customers. The hype surrounding this supposedly groundbreaking revolutionary new company drove the share price well over $80 from the $8 IPO. But from there, the stock lost over 75% of its share price to close at $20.36, which in 
when Tesla bailed Musk and his cousins out on November 1, 2016, about four years later. Turned out those shares were still way overpriced, as the company was insolvent at the time of acquisition. On top of the $2.8 billion purchase price, Tesla also had to take on $3 billion in Solar City debt. This company that had been fawned over by the press for years, promising the most efficient solar panels in the world, was actually using cheap Chinese components in their installation and they were losing money on every contract. This is what will happen with Starlink as well. It is the same model and it will have the same result. Another hyped up Musk fantasy. You'd think that people would learn. And one more thing about Musk and the prospect of an IPO for Starlink. Musk hates the SEC. Hates them ridicules them, taunts them, and he's been fined heavily by them for his past antics. But he will have to deal with them on a whole new level if this IPO were to move forward. He would have to kiss their ass and keep his mouth shut, which as we all know are not his strong suits. All things considered, if Starlink splinters from SpaceX and Musk is forced to go that route, it's pretty much going to be a last ditch effort to bail him out again and this time investors would serve themselves well to stay clear of it as it goes down. Now if you're thinking this assessment is biased in any way, ask yourself this. Can you name a single publicly traded company that siphons all of its profits and revenues back to the original private enterprise? If you can, leave that information in the comments. With regards to the Starlink system itself, there are additional concerns. We've already mentioned that these sealed units are not user serviceable, or in fact serviceable at all even by professionals. Considering that, according to the terms and conditions of the Starlink agreement, these dishes are being sold to you completely as is, that should be a real red flag and caveat emptor should be waving you off from that purchase. Here are some of the other reasons why choosing Starlink probably won't be a good fit for North Americans. One of the first things you need to realize is that this service is not suitable for people living in high density areas. The satellites do not have the bandwidth required to handle that type of traffic and they will work best only for people who are well removed from the cities. Reports are common across social media now that single trees can cause you to lose your internet connection with Starlink, which is fair enough, trees block signals, but not everyone is going to want to clear cut their property around the house before they can Netflix and chill. And for that matter, the tree that's blocking your signal might not even be on your property. Additional issues include reports that are now out indicating the system is unable to perform in conditions lower than minus 30 degrees Celsius and above 40 degrees Celsius. In Fahrenheit, that's minus 22 to 104 as the internal temperature of the dish. Now the lower end of that scale will not affect most of the lower 48, but Alaska and many parts of Canada do get well below minus 30 degrees Celsius during an average winter. But the high end of that definitely creates a problem for the continental US. Something a beta tester in Arizona found out the hard way when his dish overheated and it had to be hosed down by the owner, who decided to build a canopy for the device to give it shade and save on his water bill. Temperatures across the southern US often go north of 40 degrees Celsius. Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, they have no problem hitting that mark in a normal year. So on the hottest days of the year, you can expect to lose your Starlink connection. And in areas prone to electrical storms, it would appear that customers who don't use professional third-party installers might be lighting themselves up for another shock as dishes have already been hit and destroyed by lightning. We'll wrap up this segment with a question. When you have to buy another dish from Starlink, because the one that you had got buggered up, is the company going to charge you the same $500 for the replacement system, or are they going to charge you their full cost of it so that they don't lose another $1,500 on you? Maybe somebody could ask Musk that question on Twitter to see what kind of response you get. And then you can share it here so we can all get a good laugh. If all the other aspects of this system weren't bad enough, Starlink satellites are posing an additional threat to the entire planet through their destruction of land-based astronomy. Over the past year, there's been a steady stream of pictures show up online from amateur astronomers demonstrating how the Starlink satellites in orbit are already making it difficult to do time-lapse photography that they require for hobbyist photos or skywatching. Perfect example here would be when people last year were trying to capture images of that once-in-a-lifetime Neowise comet. But it's not just the amateurs who are having difficulty with this. The professional land-based observatories are having the same problems. Trains of Starlink satellites sweeping through a time-lapse capture completely destroy the image. But those images are not just to put up on somebody's Facebook or Instagram pages. 
These images are studied and poured over to detect near-Earth objects. And to make things even more difficult, the best time to detect these objects is during the twilight hours, which happens to be when the Starlink satellites are the most visible in the sky. And of course, the Starlink constellation will only become more and more of a hindrance as its population in orbit increases. But not to worry, because Elon Musk has already told his followers that Starlink won't affect ground-based astronomy at all. Way to ignore the indisputable evidence, you jackass. So after all the analysis, all the digging, article reading, video watching, and calculating, here are the conclusions that anyone paying attention should come to regarding Starlink. First, the Starlink constellation adds no new product to the marketplace. Second, according to one of the top latency measuring apps, Starlink is unlikely to provide a significant speed advantage to the existing products. Third, the market for this product is pretty much restricted to the remote locations of North America, Europe, and Australia, all of whom are already covered by other providers. The rest of the world needs running water more than it needs satellite internet. Fourth, the number of satellites being proposed by Musk significantly accelerates the incident rate required to realize a full Kessler syndrome annihilation of objects in orbit, which at 550 kilometers LEO could create a shroud of shrapnel around the Earth that prevents any other spacecraft from being launched. Fifth, this is not a trillion dollar industry that they're trying to tap into. In fact, it's not even projected to be a $10 billion industry globally in the next five years. Sixth, the constellation as is already jeopardizes ground-based astronomers' ability to detect asteroids threatening to collide with Earth and make other scientific discoveries. And seventh, Musk promising an IPO issuance on a spun-off Starlink will pretty much signal to the world that this model is yet another Musk failure requiring bailout. Just wait until Rocket Jesus tells you this is a no-brainer. And that's when everyone will know for sure. Thanks to all of you for tuning in to this first year anniversary episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. What a ride it's been watching this channel turn into a like-minded community, and it's incredibly rewarding for all of us here. We are going to be doing a special episode to commemorate our past year, so keep an eye out for that. Your continued and growing support for what we do here amazes us every day. And to our patrons through Patreon, thank you so much for your direct support of our channel. We do have some big changes coming in the next few weeks, and you are helping make those possible. As always, give the video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, spread it on social media, and ring that notification bell so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.